And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. We're remembering joy today. The candle we lit in the third week of Advent is the joy candle. So we're going to be taking a look at the Christmas story and looking for the joy there and remembering our joy. I want to confuse this with happy, but I do want to tell you we're going to see some happy feet when we read the scripture today. And when I thought of happy feet in the scripture, I couldn't help but go back to, do you remember in 2006 there was an animated movie called Happy Feet? This cute little penguin had so much joy inside of him, he couldn't stop his feet from moving. Because I easily interchange joy and happiness and pleasure and excitement, the first thing I want to do is just define a little bit what joy is. It's connected to happiness, but happiness and joy are not the exact same thing. Joy, you could, we could think of it as an inner feeling, happiness, and outward expression, like dancing feet. Biblical joy is a deeply rooted, inspired happiness. It can be very quiet. It can be an inner contentment. It can be an, an inner peace. In fact, I believe my joy in life grows out of that quietness inside of me. It doesn't grow out of an explosion of expression. Sometimes the explosion of expression comes from joy, but my joy doesn't come from the pleasure. It comes from a deep contentment in the goodness of God. It's not pleasure based on fun, but it's based on the goodness of God. That's where my joy comes from. And we're going to see in the Christmas story today joy that looks like the expression of happiness. I want to share a video with you that a friend of mine sent me just this past week. My, my good friend and his wife retired, moved to Florida about a year ago, and she was going out to the grocery store the other day and saw this vehicle parked in the parking lot and couldn't resist taking a, a short video of it and sending it to me, so I want to share it with you. If we could show that. <laughs> that make you laugh. There, she sent a second video uh, where around the top of the, train, uh, top of the van, a train was running around a track. I don't know what happens when they're driving with that train, but uh, it made me laugh. But it also it made me think, Heidi and I were watch, looking at this video and we're saying, I wonder what's going on inside. That was the first thing we thought of, like this explosion of what we call Christmas clutter. And then Heidi said, you know what? We're a lot like that is that we get so caught up and so covered with our Christmas clutter that sometimes we miss what's inside. And I went one step further in my thinking and, and said, the Christmas clutter can actually steal my joy. That I can get so cluttered up with things that look really good, all of the traditions and trappings and decorations and things I do, that it, it can take away my joy. Um, so anyway, I thought I would just share that picture with you, and now we can go home. <laughs> uh, we, could, we could take that down now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, sometimes we go after happiness. We go after pleasant feelings at the risk of losing joy. We see joy all through the, the Christmas story, several places. We talked a little bit a couple weeks ago about Zechariah, who was the priest in the temple, and Gabriel came to him and said, you and Elizabeth are going to have a baby. And they were old, and it was hard to believe. And the angel said, your baby will be the one who was prophesied about, who will prepare the way for the Lord. That had to bring them joy. When Elizabeth finally was with child, when they gave birth to the baby and they named him John, and they realized what the Lord was doing, there had to be joy in that. Mary and Joseph, we talked about them last week. Their path wasn't easy, but what a joy it must have been for them to realize, for it to dawn on them, that they were part of God's plan, that God was using them in a great way. And even though the circumstances were all in turmoil, they had the Lord leading them. There had to be joy in that. And the week before that, or a couple weeks before that, we looked at the, the story of the Magi coming 
400 miles to worship this baby king who would be their Lord and Savior, God in the form of a baby. And I, I imagined when they knelt down and left those gifts, there must have been a quiet joy inside that said, we are seeing the hand of the Lord Most High right here. But the place we're going to see joy today, it's in a different place from all of the ones I just mentioned. It's the shepherds. The shepherds are the ones with the happy feet. And the shepherds were the one who got the news that there would be great joy for all the people. So I want to read that passage and think about it a little bit. What caused the shepherds joy? And what was their response in that? Let's look at it. Luke chapter 2. This is a familiar passage. We read part of it with the Advent lighting. We read it every year at Christmas. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 8 through 14 in case you're following along in your own Bible. If not, we'll have it up here. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So here's where we have to start thinking about joy. It's in the message that the angels gave the shepherds. They said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. The source of the joy for the shepherds wasn't the appearing of the angels. That part terrified them. The source of the joy for the shepherds was the message that there was going to be good news for all people. What is this good news? The angels say it right in there. They said, here's the good news for you, shepherds, and all people. You're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying a manger, and he will be your savior. He will save you from your sins. It's worth revisiting this for a moment because this is the source of our joy. This is the source of our peace. This is the source of our hope. This is the source of love. All the four topics that we talk about at Advent are right here in this good news. Here's the good news as it starts. You were created to be in a relationship with God. You were made to worship him. You were made to know him and be known by him. That's the start of the good news. The bad news is you and I and everyone else who has ever breathed breath on this planet has broken that relationship, what the Bible calls sin. I've done it. You've done it. I've thought it. You've thought it. We've committed it. I have. You have. Every one of us, the Bible says, is guilty of violating the perfect law of God. And that puts us in a spot where we have a debt to pay. We owe, there are consequences, there are punishment for that. And even if I were somehow able to control my tongue and control my thoughts and never think a bad thing or never say a bad word, the essence of my sin and the essence of your sin is rebellion against God. It's in my heart I've decided I would be a better God than God would be. And I pushed him away, and I made myself God. We've all done that. We've all done it, the Bible says. And that makes me guilty. When I stand before God, he says, you pushed me away. You broke my laws. You're guilty. And he should punish us. That's what we deserve. So here's the really, really good news. Instead of him punishing us for what we deserve... He sent Jesus to this world to take that punishment for us, to sacrifice himself, to shed his own blood. Jesus said, I will take on me the sin of the world. As Jesus breathed his last on the cross, God placed all the sin. The Bible says, him who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. And somehow, cosmically, spiritually, in the economy of God, he took all of our punishment and he laid it on Jesus so that we could be forgiven, made right, made new, 
and stand before a holy God without fear of punishment. That's why the angel says, do not be afraid. It might be that angels are terrifying, but it might be that we just get afraid of punishment because that's how it ended for Adam and Eve in the garden. They had no fear when they walked with God. They were in a perfect relationship with him until they sinned, until they rebelled, until they said, no, we would be better gods than God is. And God had to cast them out of the garden into a place where now there's fear. And the root of our fear is fear of punishment. It's fear of getting what we deserve. So when the angel says, don't be afraid, it's a good reminder to us. We don't have to be afraid of God. We don't have to be afraid of his punishment because he offers us forgiveness and mercy and peace and love and hope that grow into joy. That's where joy comes from. That's what the angel's saying. Here's the good news that will bring you great joy. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you who is Christ the Lord. But the angels were terrified, and I can't go through this passage without stopping and visiting that a little bit, because here's what I do. When I read scripture, I can't help myself. I I use my imagination. And as I'm reading, I picture. I think in pictures. Some people think in words and sentences. Maybe some people think in math problems and numbers. I don't even know how you do that. But let's just say most of us either think in words or pictures. I think in pictures. When I think, I'm visualizing things. I'm seeing things. How many people think, I'm just wondering, how many of you think in words? When you think, it's actually sentences and words and and structures. You could raise your hand. Okay, how many people think in pictures? When you think, it's more like images and and scenes. Okay, it's kind of interesting that we're like that. I think in pictures. So when I'm really thinking about a Bible passage, I turn the projector on, on the screen in my mind, and I start watching it. And I start inserting myself into that story. And I try to think about what it's like. What was this like, this night like? It was dark. The sheep were sleeping. The shepherds were watching over them. They'd watched over them all day long. During the day when you're watching over sheep, you have to lead them to water. You have to lead them to crazing. You had to keep them together. You had to make sure none of them wandered off. It was a lot of work. But then at night, When you gather them together, they fall asleep, and you just have to watch for predators, night creatures, that would sneak out and grab your sheep while they're sleeping. So that's what these shepherds are doing. They had to be on watchful alert. They had to be looking for the approach of any kind of creature. It wasn't like they were dozing, and the angels appeared, and they were startled awake. Oh, no. Maybe they were dozing, but that wasn't their job. Their job was to watch. And while they were watching, out of nowhere, this angel appeared. My wife has been doing that to me the last couple of weeks. She's just sneaking up on me. I'll be doing something. I turn around, she's right there. Like, oh my gosh, she scared me. And I realize what it is. It's my hearing. I can't hear her coming anymore. It's not like she's trying to sneak up on me. I don't hear the footsteps. It's just all of a sudden, she's there. So imagine you're a shepherd. Your job is to watch in the night for the approach of any kind of a threat, and all of a sudden there's an angel there, out of nowhere. And here's how my imagination works. I'm picturing this scene. And in all of our postcards and Christmas pictures and murals and paintings, the angels are shown hovering in the sky, right? An angelic chorus in the heavenlies. That's what we see. But Scripture doesn't say that's where they were. Isn't that interesting? In every other occurrence that I've read in the Bible of the appearance of an angel, they've been on the ground. They approached on the ground, or they appeared right there on the ground. So what if, I mean, it's okay to speculate, right? What if the angel appeared right there? Like, what if the shepherds were all watching the flock, and all of a sudden there's an angel standing there? An angel! A a frighteningly holy, angelic figure. And these angels weren't like cute little valentine cherubs. These were warriors. And all of a sudden, in the dark, there's an angel. Shepherds would have a heart attack. He said, don't don't be afraid. I've come to give you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And he goes on with the rest of it. And as if that weren't enough, a multitude of his buddies show up 
a multitude of the heavenly hosts. We think of the heavenly hosts like an angelic choir, nice robes, floating in the clouds, mouths shaped like O's. <laughs> the heavenly host in the Bible is an army. It's an army. These are massively powerful angelic creatures. God has created them, and they're at a higher order of creation than we are. They can pass between the heavenlies. They can appear and disappear. I can't do that. These things, are, angels are an incredible creation of God. One of them, one angel, can take out an entire human army. One angel. What would a heavenly host be able to do? What would a thousand ang army, what would a thousand angels in an angel army be able to do? And what if, in my, now in my imagination, you think of it any way you want. They can be floating on the clouds. But what if, as I'm playing this scene out in my mind, what if a thousand angels appeared on the ground with him? And they all started shouting, singing, cheering, glory to God in the highest. It probably would shake the earth. Have you ever been in a stadium where a team scores and it just erupts? 10,000 people pounding seats and shouting and cheering and jumping, and the stadium shakes? That's only 10,000 people. Imagine what a thousand angels would sound like. And if they were surrounded all around you? Pick me off, off the ground because I just became a melted puddle. Now, maybe they were in the sky. I don't want to totally ruin everything about Christmas for you. <laughs> it just doesn't say they were in the sky. And even if they were, even if they were floating right there, maybe that would be more terrifying. A, a floating angel right in front of you, and then a thousand more, there'd be no escaping. If they had the intent to harm you, you're done. Anyway, um, that's how my mind works. And actually, what's really interesting about that, you should try it. If you don't apply your imagination to the Scripture, you should try it. Because what often happens for me is I'll start to think about the Scripture. I'll start to picture it like it really happened, like it was real. And that I'm standing in that scene and all of a sudden, I understand it a little bit more. I see it a little bit differently because sometimes, actually pretty often, we read through the scriptures and we sterilize them. We read them very quickly, we make them into a nice story, and then we move on. But if you stop and imagine yourself into the scene, sometimes it's not a nice story. Sometimes it's not an easy story. But God is always in it. And you find him there. So that's what, I, that's what I do when I read the scriptures. Let's go on. Luke chapter 2, uh, 15 through 20. When the angels had left them, this heavenly host finally disappears. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I'm going to just do a quick tangent off the topic. A comment for you, because it's just worth mentioning. This past Tuesday morning at our staff meeting, we looked at this, this passage, this line that says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And we asked each other the question, what do you treasure? Mary was not at the end of her journey when she gave birth to Jesus. It was a long journey. It was a hard journey. She gave birth to Jesus. Now she has the promise the angel told her about, but she's only partway through. She still has the flight to Egypt. She still has to walk with Jesus and raise him. She still has to watch him be crucified and die. How did Mary get through? I think this is how. She put treasure in her heart. She thought about what to hold on to. She pondered it. She filled her heart bank account so that when a withdrawal was needed, she had something to draw on. So maybe that's going to be your take home today, and it's not, the tip, it's not specifically the topic of joy. It's more like when hard things hit, and the holidays, Christmas season, 
It can be hard. We can have family challenges. We can have disappointments. We can have struggles. It's not all happiness and pleasant. Sometimes it's difficult. What are you going to do when you hit those difficult patches? Hopefully you've treasured up something. You've packed away a few memories, a few things you can hold on to to help you get through the hard times. Uh, so that's just a little bonus for you uh, on Mary. Let's look at these shepherds, because here are the happy feet. It says they hurried off. Let's go see what the angel talked about. And they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. They ran. They danced. I love the message version. I, I, I know people have mixed feelings about the message version because it's, it's um, uh, a little bit more paraphrasy, I, I guess. I like reading it as a supplement. When I really study, I pull out my study Bible that happens to be an NIV. I do most of my studying in the NIV. Sometimes I'll look at other versions, like um, I'll look at the New American Standard. I'll look at the ESV. But when I want to just like hear it the way my brain would receive it in kind of regular language, I'll look at the message version. So the message version says this. I love the phrasing. It says, the shepherds let loose glorifying and praising God. They were hooping and running, and, and they had happy feet. They were moving as fast as they could to find what the angel had told them about. And here's what strikes me, because again, I put myself in that scene. I couldn't keep up. The shepherds were much faster than I was. I was lagging behind, a little out of breath, because I'm 64. They were probably in their 20s, and they're running to find Jesus, not waiting for me. And I'm thinking about the sheep. Hey, we left the sheep. We're responsible for the sheep. They, they left the sheep to go find Jesus. And here's what it reminded me of. Jesus told two parables that remind me of that. He said there was, this is just a story, didn't actually really happen. Jesus was trying to make a point, and he was teaching people, and he said there was a man once, he was a merchant, and in his journeys he came across a pearl, a beautiful, perfect pearl that was so valuable it was worth so much, more than they were asking for, but more than he had in his pockets. So he went home, he sold everything he had, he liquidated all of his assets, and he came back and he bought that pearl. Jesus told a similar story. A man was wandering through a field, and when he was wandering through the field, he came across a treasure. I don't know, maybe it was oil bubbling up, or there was a sign that said treasure buried here. I'm not quite sure, but he discovered a treasure in that field that was worth so much, he went home. And he sold everything he had, and he bought that field because the treasure in it was way more valuable than everything he sold. That's what's happening here. Those sheep are valuable. They're important. The shepherd's job was to watch those sheep, but they left them. Why would they do that? Because the treasure they were running to was worth so much more. I could almost picture it in their minds. If we can just find this Savior, that's all that would matter. Everything else in life wouldn't measure up to finding Jesus. That's got to be what's going through their mind as they hurry to Bethlehem to find him. And they find him, just as the angel said. And it said they hurry again. In verse 17, it says, When they had seen, them, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. They hurried to Bethlehem. They found Jesus. They were so overjoyed. They had so much joy that they ran out to go tell other people what they had found. That's what my joy should do for me. When I come to Jesus and I realize what a treasure I have discovered in the Savior, my happy feet ought to go tell other people. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet that bring good news. Because in those days, they didn't have email and the U.S. mail and, um, and texting. If you wanted to send a message, you wrote it down, you handed it to the fastest runner in the group, and they ran that message to another person. If a king had an army out on a field, a messenger would bring news back to the king about how the army was doing. He would run with the note, put it in the king's hand. The king would read it. Ah, oh, we're winning. How lovely are your feet that you brought me this good news. That's how my feet should be. That this is such good news. This is such great joy that a Savior has been born to us. 
that I ought to bring that message out of my joy to other people. That's a lesson I learned from the shepherds. But here, now, we're going to come to, I think, my favorite part of this whole story. My favorite part of what I'm going to share with you. The last couple weeks, we've been making connections from Old Testament to New Testament through the story of the birth of Jesus because everything God does hangs together. Everything in the Bible makes sense with itself. Every detail. I'm always so amazed at how God has put every detail in place. Everything in the Bible happens by the hand of God. None of it is coincidence. None of it is, oh, they just happen to be in a manger. Oh, they just happen to be in Bethlehem. There's purpose to everything in this story. And this one is just amazing to me. To understand the connection of how Mary and Joseph ended up putting Jesus in a manger. Did you ever wonder about that? Like, why a manger? Why all wrapped up in swaddling clothes? And how did the shepherds find him? When the angel said to the shepherds, you'll find a baby. They, and they said the city of David, so they narrowed it down to the entire town of Bethlehem. You'll find a baby in there, wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. How did they know where to look? Did they go to every manger in Bethlehem before they found him? These are the questions I have in my mind when I read this. So to understand this, we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament, to the tomb to the grave of Rachel. Rachel was Jacob's wife. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Rachel's married to Jacob. Jacob loved Rachel so much. And when she died and he buried her, he wanted to commemorate that. So he had a tower built on the site of her grave called Migdal Eder. Migdal Eder. It marked the grave of Rachel. Migdal Eder means tower of the flock. So Jacob had this tower built, and after Rachel died, it had a purpose, not just to mark her grave, but this tower of the flock was used by shepherds to look over the flock. Because if you're watching for predators, you want to see them before they get too close. The way to see them before they get too close is to get up high. So shepherds would climb this tower, and they would watch over the sheep from there. Tower of the flock, Migdal Eder. Fast forward to, I mentioned Ruth a couple weeks ago. Ruth married Boaz. In the town of Bethlehem, she was a Moabite. Uh, Boaz was a, 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 a person of God, and uh, they married, and Ruth became the grandmother of David. Remember all those connections? Ruth and Boaz got married in the shadow of the tower of the flock, Migdal Eder. It was still standing. Fast forward a little bit more. The prophet Micah from the Old Testament. In Micah chapter 4, verse 8, he spoke prophetically about this tower of the flock. It was actually still standing when Micah wrote these, said these words. But uh, like so often in the Bible, when we're speaking about a spiritual lesson or making a prophetic statement, we try to connect it to something we can see and touch and feel so it makes sense. That's what Micah's doing here. People would have Migdal Eder in the back of their mind while Micah was saying this in Micah 4 8. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold, of daughter Zion. Former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. Micah's talking about the tower of the flock, but he's talking about God's people, not sheep. Push one more chapter forward. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is where Micah says Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. This tower, Migdal Eder, was still standing when Jesus was born. It was standing on the northern edge of Bethlehem. Micah said, Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. One chapter before that, he made a reference to this tower, Migdal Eder. You're probably thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Hang in there, because this is going to be amazing to you. This tower... Migdal Eder, in Jesus' day, took on a special purpose. It was still the tower of the flock. Shepherds still went up in it to look over the flocks. The flocks they were looking over were the sheep that were in Bethlehem. That's who they were watching. Now, this is not from the Bible, what I'm going to explain to you. This is from historic documents called the Mishnah. The Mishnah were the written records of the oral tradition of the Jewish people. In Jesus' day, 
The Pharisees held those written records. And here's what it says in the Mishnah about how you handle sheep and flocks. It says this, The Mishnah expressly forbids the keeping of flocks throughout the land of Israel, except in the wilderness. The only flocks otherwise kept would be those for temple services. What that means is general sheep and general shepherd were not allowed within town and city limits. They had to graze their sheep outside the city and town. The only flock that was allowed inside were the flock that were being used for temple sacrifice. This flock would be the sheep that were in this field in Bethlehem that the shepherds at the tower of Migdal Eder were looking over. So the, the shepherds watching over the flocks in Bethlehem were watching over sheep that were designated for temple sacrifice. These were special sheep, not general run-of-the-mill sheep. That would mean that the shepherds watching these sheep were very likely not regular shepherds. They were Levitical shepherds. Their job was to prepare the lambs that would be used for sacrifice. And this is what they would do. Oh, i got to tell you something else first. At the base of the tower, Migdal Eder, at the bottom, there was a cave, a cave-like opening. And what was kept in that cave-like opening were the lambs that were dedicated to the temple sacrifice. Now, the tower's not standing anymore, but the spot is still known. People could go to it and say, right here where this roadway is, that's where Migdal Eder used to stand. This is a real tower on the northern edge of Bethlehem. It was used for holding and preparing sheep for sacrifice. This is what those shepherds would do. When a sheep was born, a lamb, a lamb was born, they would examine it. Because for sacrifice, it had to be absolutely perfect. No blemish, no twisted leg, no droopy lip, no runny eye, no blemish, no flaw. It had to be absolutely perfect. The law was very strict about that. And they were very into keeping the strictness of the law. So if a lamb was born and they examined it, and it was absolutely perfect, and then they took it, and ran it to the temple for sacrifice, and they tripped, or they scratched it, or they bumped it, they would ruin the sacrifice. They'd have to go back and start all over, even the tiniest scratch. So they would take this little lamb, this male lamb, that they deemed was perfect for sacrifice. They would wrap it in swaddling clothes, bring it to the cave at the base of Migdal Eder, and lay it in a manger where it would await sacrifice in the temple. Have you ever swaddled up a baby, moms or dads? You swaddle up a baby, their arms are tight in, their legs are tight in, can't move. It keeps the baby snugly and warm and protected. That's what they did with these lambs. They would swaddle them up. They'd wrap them in swaddling clothes and lay them in a manger because they didn't want anything to happen to that lamb. That was the practice of the day. Now, if these were Levitical shepherds in the field of Bethlehem, and if this were the flock that was being kept for temple sacrifice, and these shepherds were watching over these sheep, and the angel appeared to them and said, you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. They would know exactly where to go. They'd go straight to the cave at Migdal Eder. Now what if? What if that's where Mary and Joseph were? What if they actually swaddled Jesus? and laid him in that manger. See, God doesn't do things by accident. There's no coincidence. Everything God does lines up with purpose. What if it wasn't a kindly innkeeper who said, you can use my animal stall? Because actually the scripture doesn't say that. We've made that part of the story. They've knocked on all the doors, and there's no room, there's no room. But one kind innkeeper goes, well, you can sleep with my animals. And they're, okay, they go back there. What if it didn't happen that way? What if Mary and Joseph went all through Bethlehem and they couldn't find a room? And she's in labor pain. And they find this otherwise unoccupied cave at the base of the tower of Migdal Eder. What if by his providence, God was leading them there the whole time? And they went in there and gave birth to the baby. And they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And they laid him in that manger where the lambs 
that were prepared for sacrifice were usually laid. Wouldn't that be awesome? And even if they weren't, okay, you might think, Rich, you're putting too much into speculating. It's not just me. There are lots of scholars who have laid this all out. I heard this two years ago. You know what I thought? How come I never heard this before? <laughs> this is amazing. But even if they weren't, even if our shepherds from the Christmas story were not Levitical shepherds, they would still know what Levitical shepherds did. They would still know about the Tower Migdal Ader. They would still know about little lambs wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. So when the angel said to them, you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, they'd go straight to Migdal Ader. That'd be the first place they'd look. This is a source of true joy to me. When I see these connections, and I see how God planned all this thing out, and how for um, years, lamb after lamb, sacrifice after sacrifice, was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, and then our lamb comes, our lamb, and he gets wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. It's like God saying, see, this is what I was trying to show you. On Wednesday night this week, we had a little family gathering, and um, I was sharing some of this with the family, and uh, Heidi's sister said, oh, there's a song, you, you have to listen to it, and we played this song, it's called Wrap This One Up. I'm going to call Amy and the worship team up here. I listened to this song called Wrap This One Up. I don't know if you've ever heard it before. I listened to this song Wednesday night. I had my phone. I was following the lyrics. I just sat there crying. I sat there. Because it tells the story of wrapping Jesus up for sacrifice. I contacted Amy Thursday morning. And I said, I know this is really last minute, but do you think you could do this song? She said, absolutely. So they're going to bless us with this song. They're going to sing it to you, and the words will be up. Uh, just receive, receive the joy of the Lord in this song.